individual who's who's in good health, uh, probably after a few days they, they, they will recover without any problems at all. It's in the high-risk groups that your real concern lies. For those who are in the high-risk groups, people in nursing homes and those with chronic health problems, vaccine is still available at Marion County's public health offices for a $3 fee. Kim? Indiana legislators are bracing for a long night after a very tedious day. This is the deadline for House and Senate bills to be amended. Bill Foster is live at 5 at the State House with a report, Bill. Well, Kim, you said it. It is the deadline, and that's why they've been meeting all day today. It is the last day that bills can be amended in the House of their origin. All day, House and Senate members have debated amendments back and forth, but most of the important, highly publicized bills are awaiting third reading and are already past the stage of rewriting. The House, in fact, has completed all second reading of bills. Now the body has nearly 150 of them to either kill or pass along to the Senate. Among those, license branch reform, the bill to change the superintendent of public instruction from elective to appointed by the governor, a bill to allow unscheduled visits to licensed daycare centers by parents or guardians, and another to remove health and nutrition rules from unlicensed daycare centers. Another consideration before the House is a bill to lower the maximum interest rate to 18% for certain credit card use. So far, the House has voted 95 to 4 to exempt not-for-profit organizations and certain individuals from needing a transient merchant license. And they voted 85 to 14 on a bill requiring the country of origin to appear on meat labels and restaurant menus. Only a couple of bills uh, already voted on in the third readings. A recess has now been called, and further action is scheduled to begin again at 7 o'clock. They'll be in their chambers who knows how long. It could go on, some say, up until midnight. They have to complete as many of the 150 bills as they can tonight because tomorrow is the third day, the uh, uh, final day for third reading. And if they don't complete those uh, tomorrow, then those bills would die. I'm Bill Foster reporting live from the State House. Back to Kim and Tom. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Still ahead on News Center 13 Live at 5, can Indianapolis afford to handle its emergencies? We'll explain. Plus, our personal finance specialist, Carol Krause, tells you how much your children should know about your money matters. And we'll rejoin NBC with continuing coverage of the shuttle disaster at the conclusion of News Center 13 Live at 5. Keep it here. You pour seed and fertilizer, herbicide, and hard work into your corn crop. You could protect that input with just any rootworm insecticide, or you could use Lohr's Band 15G and get protection from rootworms, as well as cutworms, wireworms, grubs, seed corn maggots, and other insects, and avoid problems with seed safety. This year, get more out of your rootworm insecticide. In conservation or conventional tillage, use Lohr's Band 15G. It's corn security. At the 86th Indianapolis Home Show, innovation is the star. Like the Nova Living Center from Innovative Design Concepts. With construction so unique, it's patented. So energy efficient, it's incredible. And because the Nova is a gas all-star home, you will enjoy maximum dollar savings. If your star is lucky, you could win big in the Home Show Star Stakes. A year's supply of Coke. A sprinkler system from AM Rust Landscape. Or a Florida trip for four on American Trans Air. Listen to WENS for details. Short staff service and attention to detail. Get away from it all with a family adventure weekend. Just $59 a night at the Radisson Plaza Hotel, Indianapolis. Is there a way to cut the cost? That's the question technical advisors for the city are asking themselves tonight as they review the bids for a new countywide communication system. City officials say the bids came back totaling nearly $45 million, about $15 million more than they'd expected. They're hoping their technical advisors and a consultant will find ways to trim the cost. And when that figure comes back, it will be lower than the $45 million, but the... the uh... Um, that's the good news. The bad news is, is that they've assured me that it's not going to be substantially or dramatically lower than the $45 million. So, I, you know, I think we're probably talking in the area of probably about $40 million based on the bids that we have now. Blankenbaker says there is an outside chance they'll have to ask for new bids. And he says if that happens, the new communication system probably won't be ready in time for the 1987 Pan Am Games. When teenagers think about money, it is usually to pay for a Friday night movie or to buy a new pair of jeans. Most parents keep their teens in the dark when it comes to serious money matters. 
But personal finance reporter Carol Krauss found a teacher who is filling the gap. We normally think of high school as reading, writing, and arithmetic. But how about a fourth R, realism, or how much money it will take to survive after graduation? Okay, how many of you had a savings account? This is a singles living course for juniors and seniors. Their teacher is helping them understand how much it will cost them to live on their own. First, senior Rodney Olson takes a fictitious job as an assistant manager in a clothing store with part-time work as a model. His monthly income, $1,260. Looks like good money, doesn't it? First, subtract 25% for taxes. Subtract 315 from your top figure. Then, subtract more for monthly car and insurance expenses. Then, rent and other monthly living expenses. So, if you go to the laundromat with three loads of laundry each week, you'll need $3 or $12 for the entire month. The final verdict? Rodney would not be able to live on his own for less than $1,460 a month and will have to come up with some more money. Do you think you could live on less money? No. No way. Okay. What did you think of the results? Were you surprised? Yeah, I was really surprised. I didn't think there would be that many bills. I knew it was going to be quite a bit. I didn't know it was going to be that much, though. I think I'll stay at home and go to school for now. And then I plan to move out maybe later when I'm about 20 or 22. Maybe they'll appreciate their parents more. Maybe they'll see that they need to get some skills for the job market. And uh, I'm going to pay more attention in school. If you're interested in a class like this, check with your local high school. If such a class is not offered, this is an exercise that can easily be done at home by parents and their teens. I'm Carol Krause. Experts say that even very young children can learn a great deal about managing money if their parents take the time to teach them. And still ahead, Daryl Burnett will take a quick look at sports. And reminding you, we will rejoin NBC coverage of today's tragedy at the conclusion of Live at Five. Stay with us. The children, all the... What is easier to make better choices? Indiana National gives you the most and best possible choices. Because we have more quality products and services than any other bank around. So that you can design the plan that fits your financial picture perfectly. Indiana National. More for your money. Some boxing news tonight in sports. Daryl Burnett. Right. Ron Essa is one of the many great fighters coming out of Indianapolis right now, Kim. When Ron Essa isn't punching the clock at Borden Dairy, he's punching the bag at the Powell Club, getting ready for his February 9th fight against Steve Gambles. The fight card, which features Marvin Johnson that night, is being billed. The world comes to Market Square Arena. For Essa, the world is clearly riding on this fight. And it has been mostly Ron Essa in this fight. Ron Essett is going through the proper channels to become the middleweight champion of the world, watching his fights on tape as part of his workout. The hands that hit opponents hit the rewind button. The eyes that look for openings look for improvement. And I try to pick up the little things, such as my footwork, uh, my side-to-side -side movement, little things that I feel can make me a champion in the future. The last two years haven't been easy for Ron. There was the controversial loss to eventual gold medal winner Frank Tate in the Olympic trials. Instead of being a gold medal winner, Ron has been fighting in the shadow of Tate and other Olympians since. Twelve days away from the biggest pro fight of his career, Ron hasn't forgotten his near miss in the trials. That little ounce of uncertainty, what kept me off, what, had, what did keep me off of the Olympic team, but at this point I know I have to be completely confident and be completely prepared for what I have to do, and I'm confident that I will be world champion one day. In the meantime, he works and waits to hear these words. For the winner, by a unanimous decision, still undefeated from Indianapolis, Indiana, Ron the Dragon Edson. And I feel 1986 definitely is a year of the Dragon. Well, I hope so. The Pacers, who often lack punch, are in Atlanta tonight to face the Hawks. Then tomorrow night, it's back home to face Minute Bowl and the Bullets. What a contrast. Tonight, the Pacers face the smallest player in NBA history in Spud Webb. Tomorrow night, they face the tallest in history in Minute Bowl. New England Patriot coach Raymond Berry is firing Bullets tonight. In the wake of the worst defeat in Super Bowl history, Berry says at least five Patriots have a serious drug problem. Barry made it clear he wasn't making excuses for his team's loss, but says he was aware of the problem well before the Super Bowl and held off making any public statement because of what was at stake. He also says he suspects as many as seven other players have a problem with drugs.
The only problem Jim Moore has tonight is making the New Orleans Saints winners. Moore was named the new head coach of the Saints today. And Buddy Ryan is now interested in a head coaching job with the St. Louis Cardinals. Philadelphia has already expressed strong interest in the Bears' defensive coordinator. Meanwhile, the Pro Football Hall of Fame has five new members tonight. Dope Walker of the Lions was inducted, Paul Horning of Packer fame, Ken Houston of the Houston Oilers and Redskins, Willie Lanier of Kansas City, and Fran Tarkenton. And Bob Schnelker, who caught Tarkenton's first touchdown pass as a pro, is a new offensive coordinator of the Minnesota Vikings tonight. Schnelker was recently fired by the Green Bay Packers in that same capacity. And that is Sports Tom. Thank you, Darrell. We're going to check in with Cameron Harper, who is working on 6 o'clock in the News Center right now. Tom, we're continuing to collect the latest information on the tragedy involving the Space Shuttle Challenger today and trying to put all, all the information together and put it in some kind of perspective so that we can all understand a little better this national tragedy that has occurred today, and we'll have the latest on that on News Center 13 coming up in a few minutes. And also, we will look at the rising number of parents without partners and the challenges that they face. It's a personal dilemma for many people. So we hope you'll join us coming up in a few minutes for News Center 13 at 6 o'clock. All right, Kim. All righty. Well, that's News Center 13 Live at 5 for this Tuesday. I'm Kim Hood. And I'm Tom Cochran. We rejoin the network now. Cameron and Curry will be here at 6 o'clock with News Center 13. Good night, everybody. And payload specialists on board were Krista McAuliffe and Greg Jarvis. All early indications in the Launch Control Center, the Kennedy Space Center, have indicated that the launch was normal up to approximately 11.40 a.m. this morning, about a minute or so into the flight. Flight controllers in the Launch Control Center here and in the Mission Control Center in Houston were polled immediately after the explosion reported that they did not see anything unusual up to that point. The solid rocket booster recovery ships were immediately dispatched to the area approximately 18 or so miles downrange from Kennedy along with various Coast Guard and military ships, helicopters, and planes. I have taken an immediate action to form an interim investigating board to implement early activities in this tragedy. Data from all of the shuttle instrumentation, photographs, launch pad systems, hardware, cargo, ground support systems, and even notes made by any member of the launch team and flight ops team are being impounded for study. A formal board will be established by the acting administrator very, very shortly. Subsequent reports on this strategy will be made by this formal review board. I am aware and have seen the media is showing footage of the launch today from the NASA Select System. We will not speculate as to the specific cause of the explosion based on that footage. It will take all the data, careful review of that data, before we can draw any conclusions on this national tragedy. Thank you. Mr. Moore has time for just a couple of questions from each center before returning to the effort uh, in investigating this tragedy. Uh, please wait for the microphone and uh, and, if I, and give your name and uh, your affiliation. Uh, and we'll start uh, right here with Jacqueline Bolden from Channel 6. There were some reports that the shuttle perhaps rose a little slower than in, in previous launches, and, and there seemed to be a loud noise, and then the noise kind of backed off, and then a, a rush of noise again. Did you get any reports from anyone else that this seemed different from the people who either experienced it, you know, saw it here live? I have not heard any reports at all relative to that uh, effect that you just described. None whatsoever. Okay. Um, up, up here in the third row, Michael. Oh, my name's Kevin Hamilton from WGIR in Manchester. Uh, the entire teacher in space program was designed to introduce more people, specifically youngsters, 
to the space program. Uh, this obviously is not the introduction you intended to make. What do you think the effect, the uh, long-term impact that this is going to have on the youngsters that you were hoping to attract? Well, I think we'll have to address that as time goes on. And again, I think uh, today, uh, the events of the day uh, makes it much too early for me to speculate on the long-term impacts. Okay, Alan. That was uh, Herb Ross, who is the, uh, who is the uh, administrator of the space program at Cape Kennedy, at the, uh, rather at Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida talking about uh, the fact that he has impounded all the notes and all the tapes and he will not engage in any needless speculation about what may have gone wrong until they have a very thorough investigation. He did say, of course, that there were no survivors among the astronauts so far as they could tell. It has now been just about six hours precisely oh. since there was uh, that unexpected explosion in space and as we saw, the space shuttle Challenger was consumed by a great fireball and we believe now that all seven people on board were killed. One of those that has been getting so much attention today, understandably, is Krista McAuliffe, a 37-year-old teacher from Concord, Massachusetts, the mother of, pardon me, from Concord, New Hampshire, the mother of two children, um, and her husband, who was there today, watching this launch along with her parents. Uh, Krista McAuliffe was a graduate of uh, Framingham State College in Massachusetts, which is just below uh, New Hampshire, of course. And at Framingham College, they were very proud of what she was going to do as a graduate of that school. And this evening, they held a memorial service there. And we're going to show you some pictures of that now, if we can. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of Krista who is so special to the Framingham State College community and to so many others who know and love her greatly. We pray that nothing of her life will ever be lost and that in spite of this tragedy, all those things which Krista holds to be important will be respected and continued by us who were touched in some way by her life by her quest, by her spirit. Chris McAuliffe lost today in the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger, in which she had hoped would be, of course, a day, a week of triumph for her, turns out to be the end of her life and a national tragedy. Uh, President Reagan spoke about this uh, about 40 minutes ago now when he addressed the nation from the Oval Office talking in a brief but eloquent statement about what this means to all of us. The President of the United States once again. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd plan to speak to you tonight to report on the State of the Union. But the events of earlier today have led me to change those plans. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the Shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers and overcame them and did their jobs brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes. Michael Smith, Dick Scobie, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista Mikulov. We mourn their loss as a nation together. To the families of the seven, we cannot bear, as you do, the full impact of this tragedy. But we feel the loss, and we're thinking about you so very much. Your loved ones were daring and brave, and they had that special grace, that special spirit that says, give me a challenge, and I'll meet it with joy. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve, and they did. They served all of us. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States Space Program has been doing just that. We've grown used to the idea of space, and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We're still pioneers. They, the members of the Challenger crew, were pioneers. 
And I want to say something to the school children of America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. I've always had great faith in and respect for our space program, and what happened today does nothing to diminish it. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. That's the way freedom is, and we wouldn't change it for a minute. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. I want to add that I wish I could talk to every man and woman who works for NASA or who worked on this mission and tell them your dedication and professionalism have moved and impressed us for decades, and we know of your anguish. We share it. There's a coincidence today. On this day, 390 years ago, the great explorer Sir Francis Drake died aboard ship off the coast of Panama. In his lifetime, the great frontiers were the oceans, and the historian later said he lived by the sea, died on it, and was buried in it. Well, today, we can say of the Challenger crew, their dedication was, like Drake's, complete. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them, this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. That was uh, President Reagan, uh, Reagan speaking to the uh, nation from the Oval Office today. I want to correct something that I uh, left a wrong impression about earlier. The Concord High School is where uh, Krista McAuliffe taught. The third graders who were assembled today at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral were members of the third grade class of her son, Scott. They were there with him, which makes it all the more tragic, of course, that they had to share that horrible moment as they were all there assembled looking on, as I said earlier, in a suspended state of disbelief and belief, not quite knowing what they were seeing and then learning uh, from NASA officials that in fact there had been, in the words of one NASA announcer, a major malfunction, which was the understatement of the day, if not the year, obviously. They did have the explosion. Uh, so those were third graders who were friends of her son, Scott, who were there with him, along with her parents, of course, and her husband, as well as her daughter. Robert Bazell at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Pasadena. Bob? Uh, Tom, here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is another NASA facility, there is a notice on the board here that in a few minutes Vice President Bush will be uh, briefing the press uh, from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, so I'm sure we'll be wanting to go live to that. Other than that, we might recap a few things we've, we've been saying all, all day long for those of us who are just joining us, which is that those of us who have watch, watched many launches have no clue, neither do any engineers we've talked to about what went wrong. We only see that there was an explosion, a terrible, fierce, quick explosion which engulfed the entire spacecraft. It looks like the people, the seven people on board, knew very little of what happened. They probably had no notice whatsoever. They knew nothing was coming, and I think... The only, only good news we can say is that they apparently suffered no pain whatsoever. So we have on, only that to go on. The investigation is just beginning. It's going to go on for a long time. Uh, to repeat what Jess Moore said during his press conference, who's the director of the shuttle program, there was a... Uh, he's about to speak. The, uh, there was no notice what... Uh, this, excuse me, they've impounded all the notes of all the engineers. They've impounded all the data that came down from the spacecraft, what's called the telemetry, all that will be examined in great detail, but they'll undergo something called failure analysis, where they'll, they'll try on a scale model to repeat the accident to try to understand what happened. But as of right now, we have no idea whatsoever. There was no indication of anything awry. The space shuttle took off on a cold, which may have been part of the problem, beautiful Florida morning in, into a clear sky, and suddenly it just exploded. 
Nothing like this has ever happened in the U.S. space program. As we pointed out before, three people were killed uh, 19 years and a day ago, but they were in a practice session on a launch pad, and it had nothing to do with the explosive power of the launch. And in fact, that's one of the things that people continue to point out today, is that America has sent so many people into space before without a single injury, let alone a death, uh, in the air up to now, and this is the first time. A terrible, terrible tragedy, and as yet we certainly have no clue as to what happened. We're, we're standing right now for Vice President Bush, who will be speaking to us pretty soon from Florida, where he arrived today. He was flown down on President Reagan's orders very quickly from Washington to, to see the families of the seven crew members, uh, many of whom were gathered there. It's a tradition at the Kennedy Space Center for most of the astronauts to bring their families. They go up to the roof of the huge building uh, near the launch pad, the vehicle assembly building, and when we in the press area watch the launch, usually we see all the family members, all, all of them together, they go up to, to watch uh, their family take off. And what a terrible, terrible uh, sight that must have been today, and as these people realize that the, their worst fears, which of course they always harbored, anybody who, anybody who thought about the space program always realized, as you said before, that this was a possibility but uh, we never thought well, we would see it as a reality and, and so quickly and with no warning whatsoever. Tom? Thank you very much, uh, Robert Bazell. Uh, we have just now received word that President Reagan has officially ordered all flags in the country to be flown at half-staff. The flag at the Kennedy Space Center, as we showed you earlier, has already been uh, situated at half-staff uh, until next Monday, or rather through next Monday. Naval vessels will be flying there at half-mast. That's the appropriate uh, phrase that should be used. Half-staff for those on ground, half-mast for those at sea. And, of course, as we receive any words of additional memorial services along the way, we'll let you know uh, that as well. Um, that's where we stand at, at this time. Uh, we do expect President, uh, Vice President Bush to make his statement when he arrives at uh, the Kennedy Space Center, and we expect that to happen momentarily. Shall we just show you one more time the space model uh, for those of you who have been joining us along the way? This is it. You'll be seeing a lot more on videotape, of course, during the day. This is the big aircraft, the external tank, and it appeared that that came apart at the time of the explosion. These are the two solid rocket boosters. I'm going to show you all of that now. Here's the configuration. Let's see if I can get this right. You're going to see it the same way you're going to see it in your uh, television screen. It was going in about this direction, which we're about to show you now. This is the external tank. You'll see these two solid rocket boosters and that are on either side and then you'll see this beneath it we're going to show you simultaneous tapes now of two launches one earlier this uh, year january 12th and then the one today that tragically blew up but this is the configuration so you'll know what's going on today in january 12th T minus 10 9 8 7 6 we have main engine start four three two one and liftoff liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower to that in a moment. We want to go now to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida where Vice President George Bush is speaking. The crew, the President and I and the entire nation join in mourning the seven splendid men and women who now rest in God's arms. Today's tragedy reminds us that danger awaits all who push back the frontier of space. It reminds us that the great adventure of space travel requires men and women of spirit and bravery. I'd like to say something in particular, something special to the school children of our nation, and especially those from Concord. You must try to understand that spirit, bravery, and commitment are what make not only the space program, but all of life worthwhile. We must never, as people in our daily lives or as a nation, stop exploring, stop hoping, stop discovering. We must press on. What can all of us give now to honor those we've lost? Let me suggest a memorial to them. We must be as they were. 
great in spirit, great in courage, and great in dedication to the adventure of which they were so much a part. We must resolve that, like America's pioneers of the past, others will follow, others will explore, others will risk, as these seven brave Americans risk today. And so I came here today to no, check one, two. pay our sincere condolences okay, the to the families and friends of the seven, Hello? and also to the proud men and women of NASA. We salute them in this hour of trial. Thank you very much. I'm now going to go and pay my respects to the family. I'm sure that Senator Glenn and Senator Garn might have might add something, but I'd excuse myself if you come over here if I could. I would only add very briefly that I'm pleased to be here with the Vice President. Our only purpose in coming was to pay <clears throat> tribute to the crew. It's been a very difficult day for me personally because I knew each of them. I trained with some of them. And I just extend my love and condolences to their family. Yeah, just a word. <clears throat> I'm very appreciative that the Vice President would ask us to accompany him today here, even though it is a very sad occasion. It's been nearly a quarter of a century that we thought this might happen sometime, but we've delayed that day until today. We hoped that this day would never come, but unfortunately it has, and with a tragedy that uh, all Americans share together. I share a sense of personal loss, having been involved in the program, as Jake just mentioned, he does too. And remember, yesterday was an anniversary also when Gus Grissom and Roger Chafee and, and Ed White very so very tragically lost their lives in the fire on the pad here. But since that time, you know, we've had, we've had 56 manned missions so far. 24 with the shuttle. And I guess what it points out more than anything else is that while we have many triumphs, that's the nature of all human progress is we try. Keep trying anew, trying to better ourselves and trying to learn more. While we have triumphs, many of them, once in a while, there's a tragedy. And it's that triumph and tragedy comparison that we, we have here today. One of the people who's been here all day with some of the, the families that told us coming in a few moments ago when he was talking to the families earlier, several of them said to him, don't let this slow the program down. They gave lives of their families or their loved ones or their friends in this effort. So I guess we could say that these seven that went up this morning carried the hopes and the dreams of all of us. And what we can do now is make sure that we carry their memories in carrying on. Thank you. Jake Garn, uh, each of them uh, veterans of the space program, uh, Senator Glenn, of course, an authentic member of the so-called White Stuff Group, the original group of astronauts, Senator Garn, a, a veteran pilot who was uh, selected by NASA to ride in uh, one of the missions uh, last year. He's a key member of a Senate committee that has a lot to do with the funding of NASA. There was a fair amount of cynical observation at that time that it was just an assurance on the part of NASA trying to buy some insurance that their funding would go on, but he obviously was dedicated to the program, and he talked today about these people who were his friends, including one member he called his mother hen, and that would have been the pilot, uh, Mr. Smith, who was one of the astronauts who was killed there today. Vice President Bush will be me meeting with members of the family. It's traditional to have a kind of family celebration on these occasions. Friends are invited as well because it's a special time in your life if you're an astronaut or a friend or a family member of an astronaut. You can go down there and, and watch them go into space, and it's uh, there's a festive carnival-like environment. And then today to look on, as I say, with that great feeling of exhilaration, everything seemed to be going so splendidly. And then to have it turn so instantly into such a nightmare in the sky, in those beautiful blue Florida skies, with those white contrails suddenly raining debris down on the Atlantic Ocean. 
Uh, we can talk on and on about this, but I suspect that as this day goes on, we're each dealing with it in our own personal fashion, that uh, words simply are inadequate, even the best words of the president and the vice president and the, the other people who have commented on this tragedy here today, including this commentator and this reporter and other members of NBC News. Uh, a fund, by the way, is being set up in Washington, D.C. for the children of the astronauts. It's being set up at the American Security Bank in Washington, D.C. There were nine children, I believe, who lost uh, mothers or fathers uh, today as a result of this tragedy. Uh, we have George Lewis now on the people who built the shuttle itself. All of the shuttles have been put together at the Rockwell Aerospace Plants in Southern California. When these pictures were taken in May of 1981, work was underway on the assembly of the shuttle Challenger. Today at the plant, the atmosphere was somber. The people who work here feel personally responsible for the safety of the astronauts who ride aboard the shuttles. George Anderson is a supervisor for hydraulic systems on the shuttle program. Obviously, we're, <laughs> we're upset by it all. That's about all I can say about it right at the moment. Terry Schaefer, an engineer. I was very shocked and, uh, and amazed. I just, I just heard the news, and it's incredible. It's totally incredible to me that, that anything like this could happen, especially with the, the checks and balances that they have built into the system. Engineer William Roberts offered some speculation as to what may have gone wrong. We had a catastrophic failure of the tank. That's from what I've been viewing of the uh, television film. And when you have that happen, the two liquids, the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen, they become quite an explosive mixture. You could have had the common bulkhead that's between the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. You could have had an extreme uh, pressure differential and the common bulkhead could have failed. And if that fails, you have exactly what you say, see here. Many of the people at this plant watched the live coverage as the Challenger exploded. Most are still in a state of shock as they turn to the task of trying to figure out what went wrong, trying to figure out what will have to be done to prevent it from happening again. George Lewis, NBC News, Los Angeles. And Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, uh, who was flying in that talk recently about safety. I want to correct one thing, by the way. I said earlier, I said I thought that nine children had lost uh, either a mother or fathers in the course of today's tragedy. It turns out that 11 altogether uh, children now have lost a parent as a result of what happened today. And the fund has been set up at the American Security Bank in Washington, D.C. Only Krista McAuliffe, so far as we know, was insured based on one report that we saw earlier, especially for this flight, a $1 million policy had been taken out by a space firm which donated it to her here in Washington, D.C. She did talk recently about the safety factor, Krista McAuliffe, and whether she worried about her own personal safety in this flight. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it lost one engine, and they were talking about a real severe problem. All of a sudden, boing, you know, you all of a sudden realize that, hey, things can go wrong with that thing. Oh, sure. You know, it, it is space flight. It's, you know, umpteen quadrillion pounds of thrust behind you there. Does that give you, does that give you any pause to, uh, to think? Or? Not really, because they could have landed in the car. They could have landed in Spain. I mean, they do have the ability um, to have contingencies. Um, there, there are plans in case there's a problem. And, and also the, the thought that th I think I'm going to be up on Challenger's 10th mission. And um, that just to think that the shuttle is, has gone I mean, 10 times, I mean, that's an exciting thing. And uh, no, I, I, I think it's a, a very safe program. <laughs> How did you decide to do, without going into the specifics of the particular lessons, because we'll have that, mm -hmm. how did you decide to do the lessons uh, as, as they are now planned? Well, when the 10 of us met in Washington and determined that we wanted something that was very flight specific, we wanted something that couldn't be done anyplace else or, or would not have the impact unless it you know, was done on the shuttle, we chose three lessons. And there were three categories that we came up with. And the last one, the Earth observation, which we were very excited about, after talking to the astronauts and talking to people here, we realized that there was a possibility that I would be monitoring 15 minutes of cloud cover out the window. So we had to revise that. That's still going to be done, but it's going to be done using a film that's brought back from the 51L mission. I see. Chris McAuliffe, all the obvious qualities are there. 
The irony, of course, is that she talked about this being the 10th mission of the Challenger, which it was, and she felt that it was a safe program, and if something really went wrong, that they could make an emergency landing, either in Senegal or in Spain, or go once around and land back at the Cape again. They never had that opportunity today. They were engulfed by that giant fireball, and all apparently were killed. That's the word now from NASA officials today. No sign of any survivors whatsoever. Uh, John Palmer will continue the NBC News coverage of this national tragedy. I'm preparing now for NBC Nightly News, will, which will come on in most areas, I would guess, at its regularly scheduled time. For those stations who want to cover, cut away now to their local programming, they should feel free to do so. We'll continue our coverage from New York with John Palmer in just a moment. Gold. How about some coffee? The caffeinated. Half a cup's fine. You drink decaf. Sure. And when I find one that's got a full flavor, I'll have a full cup. This one does. Brim? It's got full, rich flavor. Now this is a fine. Fill it to the rim. With a full, rich taste of brim, decaffeinated coffee. I just want to say that I am tired, tired of dumb old restaurants. I agree. You gotta sit still and not run around. And you know what else? They make you eat stuff like linguine. Carbonous the way it is, old Dave does need the money. And that's why nobody will sell you a new used car for less money than Dave Mason here. Nobody. Our address, 1202 North Shaitlin. Where else? King, Sunday at 5 on Channel 13. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. A minute 15 seconds, velocity 2900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Good evening, everyone. We are reminded tonight, painfully, that the path to the last frontier is filled with danger. It looked so perfect and went so terribly wrong. Fifteen seconds. The Space Shuttle Challenger on the launch pad under a crystal blue Florida sky. As the engines came to life, Challenger carried the first school teacher, six other astronauts, and the special sense of pride we as Americans have in our space program. Then suddenly, at 11.39, the American heartbeat stopped for a moment of absolute horror as the Challenger exploded. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. It was an explosion the size of a small nuclear bomb. The shuttle was ripped apart, and the astronauts probably killed instantly. Extremely slow-motion replays show a moment of flame along the side of the shuttle's huge liquid fuel tank, 500,000 gallons of highly explosive hydrogen and oxygen. NASA doesn't know what caused it. We will not speculate as to the specific cause of the explosion based on that footage. It will take all the data, careful review of that data, before we can draw any conclusions on this national tragedy. For Krista McAuliffe, the 37-year-old school teacher from New Hampshire, this was to be the trip in which she was bringing back what she called the wonder of it all for school children all over the world. What was she looking forward to most? Seeing the Earth, seeing the perspective of the Earth, and just being able to um, see the planet. I mean, you see it in pictures, but to be able to see that in reality is going to be wonderful. Her youngest daughter was not so enthusiastic. Because I don't want to just go in space because I just want to stay around my house. During her training, McCullough said what she missed most was hugging her kids at night. Her parents were among the hundreds of VIPs watching at Cape Canaveral. 
when they were told the vehicle has exploded. In New Hampshire, the pride of McCulloch's students turned to sorrow and shock as the catastrophe occurred before their eyes. In their own homes, the families of six others watched too. Mission Commander Dick Scobie, who was fascinated by flight. Judy Resnick, who helped open space to women. Ronald McNair, one of the first black astronauts. Ellison Onizuka, the first Japanese-American in space. And two other first-time astronauts, Michael Smith and Gregory Jarvis. It will, of course, take, we take weeks, months to learn, if we ever really do, what went wrong. But that terrible image will be with us for a lifetime. Gary? President Reagan says he's pained to the core over today's shuttle disaster and that the nation shares his grief. In a five-minute address from the Oval Office, a grim-faced president said, this day is one for mourning and remembering. He says the nation must not forget the men and women in space are pioneers. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. Their deaths indicate a level of their dedication. The words of a former Indiana astronaut with close friends aboard the Challenger. Rich Van Wyk tells us how Joe Allen views today's tragedy, its personal and national impact. Of the day because of Joe Allen, a veteran of two shuttle flights, is visibly shaken by today's tragedy. But it is inevitable that sooner or later an accident happens. That, uh, um, one uh, about to go into space does not dwell on that. You've uh, dealt with it in your mind many, many weeks, if not months, if not years before. Uh, were I given the choice to do it again, I would go again. The Crawfordsville native and DePaul graduate was personal friends with five of Challenger's seven astronauts. He rode two other shuttles into space before retiring last year after 18 years with the space program. How will today's in-flight explosion affect the shuttle's future? Uh, it's it's uh, clearly going to bring it to a halt in terms of, of ongoing flight. Uh, that does not mean it will come to a halt in terms of, uh, of uh, reconstructing what happened and uh, taking measures to prevent it from ever happening again. No one knows what went wrong, but Allen suspects there was what he calls a catastrophic failure of the main engine as it was being brought back to full power. He doubts the ejection seats would have saved the crew. The success of 24 previous shuttle flights made space travel seem almost routine. But in Allen's words, today shows us it is still a risky business and still very difficult to do. Rich Van Wyk, New Center 13. And indeed, NASA has said there will be no more shuttle flights until the cause, or at least more about it, is known in what happened today. This is the second time that astronauts have died in this country's quest for space. Don Ellison is in the News Center now with a look back to an event that occurred, ironically, 19 years ago yesterday. Don? Yes, indeed, Cameron. It was January 27, 1967, when a flash fire took the lives of three astronauts, Virgil Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee. The trio were in their Apollo space capsule preparing for the first launch of the Apollo series. Flames erupted and fed by the pure oxygen atmosphere in the capsule engulfed the astronauts in seconds. They had no chance to escape. Gus Grissom was one of the original seven astronauts chosen for the space program, and today in his hometown, Mitchell, Indiana, the national mood was aptly reflected. It was cold and gray and quiet. Some of Gus Grissom's family still live in Mitchell, which is just south of Bedford. His parents were taking refuge today in their small frame house on Grissom Avenue. And brother Norman, who owns the newspaper, also declined to be interviewed, but it was apparent in his eyes that today's disaster hit very close to the hearts of Grissom family members. The man who spearheaded the drive to erect a monument to Gus Grissom, Don Caudell, grew up with Gus in Mitchell, and he too felt the similarities. It left me empty, almost like uh, instant exhaustion. Uh, maybe even a little more so because 19 years ago the space program was in its infancy, so to speak, and uh, I think most of us realized that uh, there was considerable danger involved. And during the ensuing years, uh, it's become old hat. Caudell says that most of the people who live in Mitchell today don't make a strong connection between today's tragedy and the tragedy that took the life of Gus Grissom because those who grew up with Gus Grissom, most of them don't live there anymore, and the rest were too young to remember what it felt like 
when they heard the news 19 years ago yesterday. Cameron? Don Ellison in the News Center. Thank you. The seven lost in the space shuttle explosion were very close to a West Lafayette couple. 34-year-old teacher Robert Forrester was a finalist to be the first teacher aboard the space shuttle. Today, Forrester and his wife, Lee, talked the day over with Bill Gephardt. The people of West Lafayette began lowering their flags to half-mast immediately after they heard the tragedy, particularly the people of Cumberland School. This is where astronaut hopeful and teacher Robert Forrester instructs. Forster and his wife returned home from Cape Canaveral last night, and he says the shock may never be fully realized. Disbelief, because we've seen so many shuttle launches go up with no problems, and uh, you just assume that they're going to be okay. Forster, like 14 astronauts, graduated from the Purdue School of Aeronautics. Although no one from Purdue was aboard the shuttle, the tragedy has special meaning. The school is located here in Grissom Hall. It's named for Gus Grissom, who graduated from here and died 19 years ago in a simulated launch of Apollo 1 at Cape Canaveral. For Forrester, as Krista McCullough was being selected to be the first teacher aboard the shuttle, they worked closely together. I worked with Krista, of course, during the summer and going through the training and the selection process, and, and we kept in touch uh, so that we could coordinate our efforts uh, for teaching the lessons on board. Forster's wife, Lee, also deeply feels the loss. She's thinking about McCullough's young daughter, who didn't want her mother to go into space. It's a tragedy. It's a, a pure tragedy. You've lost seven wonderful people who've pursued a dream, and, you know, there's no explanation for a loss of lives. In spite of today's loss, both Forster and his wife want the program to go on. For Lee, she knows sometimes pioneers are lost. For Robert, should he be selected, he knows NASA won't put up the shuttle unless it's safe. From West Lafayette, Bill Gephardt, News Center 13. Reaction to the news of the space shuttle tragedy is one of shock and sadness. And some Hoosiers are concerned that tonight NASA may have tried to do too much too soon. I'm, I'm moved by it and upset, and I, uh, I wonder about the uh, urgency of these shuttles. Do they have to go up so often? I think the public should be more aware of how the money's spent and where it's going and what it's, you know, what it's being spent on. I know that this country and, and everybody is, hearts are bending because of the incidents and the families, and, and we just need to all stop and just pray and, and ask that the Lord take care of their families, because uh, it was really a, a, really a, a horrible situation. You know, it's always worked before, and I think that's why it was such a shock when the mm -hmm. launch did not work. Today, it's something we could always count on, we could always be proud of, and Nancy Reagan, watching all of this at the White House, said, oh, God, no, and I think that probably was an expression of what the nation was feeling and saying at that moment. The rest of us, too. We'll be back with other news of the day right after this. Now's the time for no-frill farming. It's getting back to basics, doing more jobs for yourself. Suit 10 Plus fits right into no frill. Suit 10 Plus costs dollars an acre less, yet gives better performance on foxtails and annual grasses. With Suit 10 Plus, you get the job done right and at the right price. It's time for no frill farming, and Suit 10 Plus is right for the times. We've got the shape, the shape you want. Your Lincoln Mercury dealers announced 7.9 annual percentage rate financing. An attractive figure to get your budget into shape now. 7.9% financing on manual transmission Mercury Links, on the sleek Mercury Topaz, on the V6 Mercury Cougar, plus 7.9% financing on the 1985 Mercur XR4TI. At this rate, you've got a great way to get into shape. We've got the shape, we've got the shape, the shape you want. On March 1st, Blue Cross and Blue Shield introduce Preferred Care of Indiana. Since then, it's become the fastest growing health care alternative ever. More than 50,000 residents have signed up, and the majority of Indiana's hospitals and physicians are now preferred care providers. And as more people choose the uncompromising health care and reduced costs of preferred care, you'll hear nothing but more good news. Preferred Care of Indiana, unsurpassed health care coverage you can bank on. Census Bureau experts estimate tonight that half of the children born in the 1980s will spend part of their childhood living with just one parent. So far, less than 3% of those parents are men. 
In part two of Parents Without Partners, Del Marie Cobb looks at what helped an all-male family to cope. Jim Thomas and his sons appear to be the perfect family, but over the past four years, they've made major adjustments in their lives. When Jim and his wife divorced, he immediately asked for custody of the boys. We had to find out a lot of things that, uh, you know, for instance, cooking, uh, house chores. Uh, we had to take 100% responsibility of that. And used to, we only did part of it. I, I cried a lot, and I always thought about it for a long time. Thomas says it took a couple of years to get his life back to normal. What helped was a counselor's suggestion that he join Parents Without Partners. It helped his sons as well. When we first started going to those things, I thought that like, I was worse than anybody else. And then after I got to know a few of them, they, I found out that I wasn't. That some of them were much worse off than I am. We've got it not too hard. We just recently moved out of a... This is the teen's version of what is like at a PWP meeting. Like the adults, they too work out the problems of coming from a broken home. Because I haven't seen my dad in like two years. In front of the group, two sisters disagree over their parents' divorce. Kind of, I, I want to have, I want to have a mom and a dad. Um, Danielle and I don't always get along real well. So I can understand why she might blame me for other things. But for the divorce, I, I don't understand that all I can do. Divorce, just like death, means accepting it and going on with life. The Thomases have done just that, and with very little regret. There's only one thing that I think of. I'd like to have, uh, it'd be nice to have somebody to cook your meals for you. But I think we do just fine the way it is. We, we cook. We all cook. He's starting to cook a lot. We do this one. In part three of Parents Without Partners, we'll look at the organization itself. Delmarie Cobb, New Center 13. Tonight, Luciano Pavrotti appears in concert at Market Square Arena. And in the second of two reports, Kim Hood takes us behind the scenes with an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with this famous Italian tenor, who tonight shares his thoughts on aspiring singers Placido Domingo and retirement. <laughs> rehearsal for the Luciano Pavarotti concert at Market Square Arena. An acoustical nightmare for this great Italian tenor. But through the magic of a specially engineered setup, his voice will be amplified to over 10,000 fans. Those fans are why Pavarotti will play here instead of a finer concert hall. It's called reaching out and sharing opera with the masses. Uh, I think I am... Uh one of the best person to do that because I like uh, uh, communicate with uh, with people, not just with audience, with people. There's another tenor out there. We won't mention any names, but is there a rivalry? And if there is, is it good for both your careers? Why, considering that our profession is one of the most difficult uh, profession in the world? When he's not on stage himself, Pavarotti is helping young singers enter his difficult world. In fact, a number of Indiana singers have competed and placed in the Pavarotti competition held in Philadelphia. His advice to them? They must be very tough with themselves. They must really uh, be Im impossible, never content, never happy for what they, they have uh, obtained. And they have always to try to do better. And what does this music maestro do after his final career curtain call? Uh, I was a teacher for elementary school before I began my profession. And I, I, I would like to be a teacher when I, I, I retire myself. The concert begins at 8 tonight, and although tickets are still available, Pavarotti is expected to sing to a full house. Coming up from the News Center, Bob Gregory on a possible thaw for Central Indiana. We'll have details. And in sports, the New England Patriots talk about drug problems in their ranks. Tell you how to save a bunch of money when you wander Indiana in the wintertime. Such a beautiful Indiana winter's day. I gotta invite all you winter wanderers to get out and get down.
Come on, Wander, Indiana. Just call 1-800-2-WANDER and save up to 50% on hotel motel accommodations with a free winter wonder coupon. Do it now, because everybody... Can you serve tacos at home that taste like they came from a fine Mexican restaurant? Can you get crispy taco shells made from fresh corn instead of processed corn flour? And the chunky taco salsa with the flavor of sun-ripened tomatoes, fresh onions, and fire-roasted chilies? Yes, for the taste of authentic Mexican food, see Ortega. Eastgate Chrysler has become one of the largest retailers of Chrysler's employments in America by selling cars for prices like this. This is the finest minivan money can buy, the Voyager. You get front-wheel drive and a five-year, 50,000-mile warranty free. Oh, and one other thing. If you buy a half a dozen Voyagers, you get your own personal bodyguard, the two-time light heavyweight champion of the world, Marvin Johnson. Out Marvin. there, is it? Help! Eastgate Chrysler Center, <laughs> just 500 North Salem, Indianapolis. We're so upset at Herb for not coming to Burger King, we're offering a special deal on burgers to everybody but Herb. Just say, I'm not Herb. I'm not Herb. And get a regular burger for 39 cents or a cheeseburger for 49 cents. I'm not Herb. I'm not Herb. I'm not Herb. And what if your name happens to be Herb? Just say, I'm not the Herb you're looking for. That's a burger for just 39 cents, cheeseburger for 49 cents. Just for saying, Bob Gregory's weather carries the seal of approval from the American Meteorological Society. I think Bob has an answer to my question about a possible thaw. Well, maybe later on. We'll take a look at what we can expect over the weekend. But there is some light snow or intermittent snow headed for Indiana overnight. Give you the reasons why here in a moment. But let's uh, take a look at the numbers. 18 and 1 so far for us today. As far as our high-low combination is concerned, normal is uh, 34 and 18. Uh, at the present time, though, out at the airport, Still overcast, 18 degrees officially. Here in the weather center, it's 17. Humidity at 70%. Southeast breeze at 10 and the pressure 2984, and it is rising. On the weather map, here's what's going on. Relatively mild flow, so some snow flurries ahead of the low pressure cell, and it's going to continue to drift over our area by tomorrow at noontime over in the western part of the Carolinas. By tomorrow night, it's out of the picture. High pressure will take over, so it's going to continue cool again. And then on Friday, this may bring a tad of snow our way. Temperatures in the 20s and 30s, so actually thermometer tonight will go up a little bit. This will uh, indicate the flurries uh, overnight tonight and into tomorrow. So my AccuWeather forecast for central Indiana now. Uh, snow may be accumulating anything from a cover to as much as an inch here. Farther northern Indiana, a couple of inches are possible. A few flurries around tomorrow with a high temperature of 30 degrees. We'll have a west-northwest wind, 8 to 16 miles an hour. And then with clearing skies and a fresh snow cover, quite cold tomorrow. Low anywhere from 6 to 12 above. Thursday, a bright day. Cold, though. 27 will be the top temperature. Friday, looks like a day for some snow, and then we'll mix it up with clouds and sunshine right at the normal of 35 for both Saturday and Sunday. I think the light snow may get in here around 9 or 10 o'clock tonight. And I'll have a new NFL coach for you. And we'll be back right after this. You only have 11 hours. This Wednesday only at Fretter Appliance. 11 hours to save on appliances, TVs, and stereos. Like this 19-inch color portable TV. Just 157. A sharp touch control carousel microwave. 187. A Toshiba front load VHS video recorder. 297. Only 11 hours. This Wednesday only at Fretter Appliance. Be there before the savings end at 9 p.m. Only 11 hours to get these low Fretter prices before time runs out. Because you can't afford it. Sharp is Ford in Indiana. Now everyone has a tax sale. We offer a little more. The max sale at Sharp Ford. Maximum savings, maximum selection, maximum discounts, and maximum effort in making your purchase a pleasant one. Our large sales value means that we can sell each Ford for less. We get a low driveway price and that makes it easier to buy. And right now our driveway prices will show you it's the time to buy. The max sale. That's why Sharp is Ford. Hi, everyone. New England Patriots coach Raymond Berry revealed today that his team has a drug problem. Now, he would not say how many. Reports of 12 were erroneous, but two of his players have been successfully treated. The team, despite the Players Association's protests, has voted to become the first to undergo voluntary testing next year. 
Jim Moore is the new coach of the New Orleans Saints. He was last with the USFL's Baltimore Stars. The newest Hall of Fame members will be Fran Tarkenton, Dope Walker, Paul Horning, Willie Lanier, and Ken Houston. Pacers in Atlanta tonight. Uh, last time out at MSA, the Pacers broke a six-game losing streak against the Hawks. As a matter of fact, they beat them by 20. But Atlanta has been playing extremely well. They're 24 and 18 and have to be considered one of the most improved teams in the league. By the way, Manute Bowl is here tomorrow night. George Gervin has been helping, but it hasn't been able to take up all of the slack for the Chicago Bulls left when Michael Jordan was injured. George doesn't have many nights like he had last night against Dallas anymore. He had 35 in the first half and finished with 45, but Dallas won it. Now, I'll take a peek here at one of the major reasons they did it. Shots like this one coming up from Derek Harper and the 33 of Orlando Blackman. You'll recognize a familiar face at last night's Georgetown Providence game, former Indiana player Del Ray Brooks. Providence didn't give the Hoyas much of a scare, Ralph Dalton there. The Friars' Steve Wright shows you what kind of problems Providence was having. Then Georgetown simply took it down to the other end, worked it around the perimeter, and Michael Jackson hit David Wingate, who knocked it down for two of his 20 points. Let's go to my last tape here now, if we can. I want, I want you to see one goal here tonight. This is on page five, in case you're interested. Quebec's Michel Goulet recorded his 34th and 5th goals of the season last night against the New York Rangers. Watch this next one, though, by Norman Rauschford. Off the seat of the pants of Mike Ridley. And the Nordiques won that game. See you tonight at, the, uh, at 11 o'clock for the full report. All right, we're back in a minute. Hi, I'm Dave Garst. When we started selling Garst Seed, we wanted to provide two things, the best people and the best numbers around. Our people go the extra mile to help you get the best yields, and our new Garst numbers are better than any we've ever sold. Last year, our best Garst varieties came out on top in thousands of on-farm yield checks. We've always had the best people. Now we've got the best numbers to go with them. Come to Garst Paydays, February 19th through 21st, and we'll prove it. Now's the time to save on that new Nissan Collar truck you've been wanting. See your Indiana Nissan dealer today and save hundreds during our 1986 tax sale. Plus, get closeout savings on all new Nissan trucks and selected cars. If two great sales in, in one. one, you can save hundreds during our 86 tax sale. Plus, you can save even thousands with closeout prices on all trucks and selected cars. Get twice the savings now during our 86 tax sale plus at your Indiana Nissan dealer. Wool Van Dyne Products, the very fabric of American industry. I'll show you what I mean. Van Dyne Crotty designs and delivers clothing of all kinds to all kinds of companies. From handsome career apparel to rugged work clothes. From crisp, clean uniforms to shirts and slacks for service or delivery. The very fabric of American industry. When you need to look good, we've got you covered. Today's shuttle mishap was a national tragedy. President Reagan has called the seven crew members national heroes. They are. We'll choose to remember them the way we see them in the photograph. Good night, everyone. Stay tuned for continuing coverage from NBC Nightly News. Have a good evening. Throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger. The worst going. disaster in the history of spaceflight. The space shuttle Challenger blows apart, killing all seven people on board. One minute, 15 seconds. NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. It was a nightmare, a cruel, shocking end to what everyone expected to be another triumph for the space shuttle program. The space shuttle Challenger with a school teacher and six regular astronauts on board was consumed by a giant fireball less than two minutes after it was launched into bright blue Florida skies at 11.38 Eastern time this morning. The path to space was filled with debris and death. All seven people were killed. High technology, which we take so often for granted, turned on us. It was a tremendous blow, a loss so cruel, so unexpected that we're still trying to deal with it. The victims. Flight Commander Francis Dick Scobie. He'd flown in Vietnam. He was 46 years old. He leaves a wife and two children. 
Navy Commander Michael Smith, the pilot, also saw action in Vietnam, 40 years old. He leaves a wife and three children. Mission Specialist Ronald McNair, a physicist, was 36 years old, a wife and two children. 